you get started? What brought you here to the U of A? Well, when I was a senior in high school, my parents thought it was very important to go to college somewhere. And, uh, you know, at that time, I was more interested in training horses than, than going to college. But I figured uh, if I were going to go to school, I'd like to go somewhere that at least has some, some involvement with the, with the industry. Actually, my dad was racing at the time at Louisiana Downs, and Pat Pope was a racing secretary there. He was also a graduate of the and he said, you need to go to Tucson, you need to visit it, you need to see it, I think you'll like it. My dad and I came out here, I think it was probably sometime around this time of year, December, or December was pretty cool in Tucson. And, um, so, I just figured it was kind of the right, right fit for me, and uh, plus it was probably one of the few places I could actually get in. Were you a good student? I was not a very good student. I was an average student. I almost kept it between the lines, but it uh, wasn't a primary focus. Uh, you grew up not too far from here. How did you end up here? Well, my, um, we grew up in Nogales, which is you know, the border an hour from here, and uh, we, could, we didn't have a choice. It's either U of A or we weren't going to go to ASU. Because that was like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, one of those things where uh, and my, my mother, it was, uh, she was a, a teacher and a principal in Nogales, so you know, education was very important to her. And, I wanted to be a jockey, and because uh, I grew up with my dad, you know, with horses with him, and so, but I had to promise her that I would graduate from college first before I would, you know, and uh, so went to school, and uh, I mean, I had great years here. I mean, I loved you know, the, you know, University of Arizona, the campus, everything. I joined a fraternity. I mean, I think I was the first one ever being a fraternity in my in my family, and. Uh, it was just a really, I got every ounce of university life, and um, it was like the best five years of my life. <laughs> so, so I really enjoyed it. Luckily, uh, this racetrack management program had just come along. So I thought, hey, here's some easy classes there that maybe I could skate through, because you know, it, it was interesting, I enjoyed it, and I met a lot of good friends uh, from it. Matter of fact, Jimmy Bell, who a lot of people know from John Bell Farm, I met him in class because I saw this guy, he's got a Blood Horse magazine on his, he's reading the Blood Horse magazine during class. I go, hey, when you're done with that guy, have that, you know? And so, uh, and I got to, you know, become good friends with him. And so it was one of those things where uh, it was just, you know, to me, you know, I've had one child graduate from Deer Canyon, he went here, and uh, it's just an all around, you know, beautiful, campus to me, you know, uh, it, it means a lot to me. Plus, well, I have it, he doesn't have it. I, I, I'm, I got honored in the uh, um, Hispanic Hall of Fame. He doesn't have something like that. <laughs> Same goals. <laughs> True. True. So, besides learning how to rush for training, what did you learn most? Well, I think... Well, which is an important skill. The, uh, I think what you learn in college is, and I'll never forget this, the first week I'm thinking, I've never had this kind of freedom. I don't, I can get home, I can stay up as long as I want, have nobody to answer to, and right off the bat, you have to learn responsibility on your own. Nobody's telling you, you don't have your, your dad getting you up at six in the morning, get out there and feed those horses, and uh, go do this or go do that, you're like, it's up to you to make sure you get up and go to class, you have to learn to study. So college, I think a lot of it is just the responsibility that you have to take on without somebody just poking you, saying, hey, come on, you better do this. Like what I'm going through with Bodhi right now, you know, like, uh, but it's, it's one of the, I think responsibility is probably, it's the first, you know, I had, we had a lot of responsibility uh, growing up on the ranch. Like he, with his dad, with horses, he probably got to do this and different things like that. But, uh, but when you're on your own, it was like, wow, I've got all this freedom, and uh, but you, you know, take advantage of it. You know, you've seen other people, they go there, and they just, they can't hack it. What did you learn? So, similar things. Um, it, was, it was funny, I was thinking about the last night flying in, I was uh, actually in the, in the Hall of Fame. I'm in the Arizona Daily Wildcat Hall of Fame, so. My, 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 I've never heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> 
school, it's a school newspaper, so my, my, <laughs> my roommate was working as the, I guess, the lead football writer for the Arizona Daily Wildcat. And he came to me one day and he said, hey, there's a really easy job that opened up. The guy that writes that covers intramural sports quit. He said, all you gotta do is write an article about some game that you watch, and it's $15 per game, per article. And um, so what I did, I was, I was refing, refereeing intramural sports, and I would watch a game, referee a game, and then I would write an article about it. So I tell my kids now, I held two jobs while I was going through college. <laughs> and, uh, but it was, it, was, it was good fun. But I, I, think, I think what you learn in college is, is like, Bob said, you, you know, you're, you're on your own for the first time. You've got you to find a balance in life between responsibility and having fun. And, uh, you know, you meet a diverse group of people that, uh, you know, when you're in high school, you kind of have your little clique of friends that you hang out with. But uh, you go to college, you get into fraternity, it's a diverse group that, uh, you know, you learn how to, to socialize with and get along with. What is your first memory of a horse? Um, actually, I think probably when I was like three years old, following off a pony that my grandfather had in the backyard of his, uh, his ranch house. It's one of the first ones. Uh, and then from a racing perspective, uh, 1975, my dad won the first leg of the triple, uh, quarter horse triple crown with a horse named Chase Step, uh, Kansas Futurity. And his arch rival was a horse named Bugs Alive in 75, which makes it easy to remember. Uh, that horse went on to win the All-American, but it was, a, it was a pretty good rivalry, and uh, so to me that was sort of a pretty exciting time as a eight or nine year old to, you know, to watch my dad run those kind of races. That's, that's big time, because I, I was growing up with quarter horses, and I remember Chick's Neck and Bugs Alive at 75, because we watched the All-American, and uh, to me, we were growing up, and my dad had this dream of maybe we could raise a quarter horse to win the All-American and make a million dollars. Because <laughs> it was, um, that was the whole, the whole, the quarter horse. I mean, if you could, the All-American at the time would change people's lives if you could win that. You know, everybody that won that was a million dollars. It would be like 10 million today. And so uh, that was the whole, you know, and, I, and when I tell these stories, and he actually, he heard me telling, talking about something because we know a lot of the same people because he grew up in New Mexico and was on the, on the same, like that Johnny Beans tax shop, everybody would go to buy all your stuff. And, and so that was, I remember my father, he would just, we'd be in Nogales and he'd want to, he'd decide he'd want to train his own little homebred and, on the side, but we'd have to drive to Sunland Park to this tack shop that had everything, saddles, and we'd, he'd buy like $2,000 worth of stuff. Stuff we didn't even need, but we just brought it anyway. We had everything, liniments, whatever. So, you know, I remember those, to me, that's how I, I got involved in it. And I was just, I was only about 10 years old, 10, 11 years old. And so that was his dream. And, and I just hung, and I loved going to, to me, Southern Park was just huge for me. We'd go there and, uh, and then we then we go to Rio Del Sol and we go watch the All American and uh, come back and uh, and load up the station wagon full of gear, you know, for tack and stuff, you know. And your mom knew all about you riding races, right? I wanted to be a jockey really badly, and so um, but my mother was totally against it, so we couldn't tell her what was going on. And finally, I had a mount at Sonoya, Arizona, which is right down the road from here, and uh, and she had a friend, her name was Nora Pickerel, who had jumping horses, and but followed everything. I'll never forget, I was in the bathroom, I was in the shower, was in there getting ready, and and my mother comes and knocks on the door. She goes, Bobby, what's going on? I said, no, I'm just taking a shower. She says, is that right, you're a jockey today? You're gonna ride a horse today? He says, no, of course not, where'd you hear that? He says, Nora Picker told me, she says, tell Bobby good luck today. <laughs> He's riding a horse. Now it's, it's probably misprints. my dad's training, spill bathroom, beat bathroom. So we went up there and, um, but you know, we, my father and I, we did, we did, uh, I was, we went to a match race one time and uh, 
And he would pick me up. I was 15 years old. He picked me up from high school. And I was riding his mattress. That's how I got into it. And uh, we went, to, it was two back Arizona, and it was, and I picked up a mountain for extra money. And so I picked up a mountain. If you won, it was $100. If you, $50. If you won, it was $200. So that was a lot of money for me. And so I picked up this mount, and I come out of the gate, and the horse next to me, I'm in a saddle, in an exercise saddle, and the guy next to me, he's strapped on with the overgirth, like, you know, it's like Mexican style, with the, with the golf ball, so you can't, you're on there, it's like bareback, and so you can't get out. And we, um, but apparently the fix was it, because the horse I was running against, uh, was that they'd been, he was like a heavy favor, and my father had been on my horse. And so we leave the gate, and this horse just jumps out about a half, three quarters of the length of the ground. And we go about 50 yards, and it's this narrow track, and the cars are just lined up on the side. It's all lined up. And all of a sudden, he hits his horse, and his horse bolts and goes off the track. And he's off the track, and I'm like, well, I guess I won. And I look over, and the guy, is on the other side of the car, still whipping and riding his horse. So I'm thinking, I guess the race is still on, so I keep riding. But he's like, he's way far away. It's ridiculous, you know. So, so I win the race, and I and I come back, and then the guys they start in this argument. The guy, you know, you know I'm all excited, and, and the guy gives me two hundred dollars, and then the guy starts arguing, and they lost a little bit, a lot of money. No, we have to have a rethink. My horse came off, and. They're, and the guy starts, they get in a fight, and the guy, they start a little fist fight. So one of the guys runs back, and this, I'm with my father and my uncle that went with us, and the uh, guy brings out a rifle and starts shooting it. So everybody just scatters. I mean, it's crazy. Like, everybody jumps in their cars, and they start leaving. It's a dusty thing. And, and so one of the guys is driving, and, and, I'm, and I will never forget, this guy's in the track leaving, and I said, and I said Dad, and you can't see anything because it does. It's, that guy's gonna hit the starting gate. He's running, he's going fast. Sure enough, he hits this bang. Guy crashes in there. And my dad goes, hey, that's the guy that I bet my $200. You know? <laughs> so, um, and I'll never forget, we came out, the guy, but he, we, we couldn't run there anymore because the guy ruined the gates because he ran into it. And everybody left. And I'll never forget, um, we're in the car, and my dad says, don't you dare tell your mother what happened here today. <laughs> but that's what, that's the way I came up with racing and uh, the different match races we go to and the people we hung out. And it, it's just, uh, I've lived a pretty exciting life. But for both of you, the common thread is your dad who got you into the, into the sport. Todd, what's the best advice your dad ever gave you? Uh, there's, there's been so, so much good advice he's given me so many different times, but I, th I think what one thing that he did for me when I was was still in high school is he, you know, I, I pretty much worked for him every summer growing up, and he said um, I'm going to spend a couple of summers working for some other people and uh, you know seeing how they do things. So he was very good friends with a, a guy named Henry Marino who's a trainer in California. So I went out and I spent one summer with Henry. And uh, it was a great experience, a great guy, very personable guy. And kind of got to you know, see how he did things. And then the following year, I worked a summer with, uh, with uh, Wayne. And uh, <clears throat> actually did my internship when I was here at the University of Arizona with uh, Charlie Whittingham. So one summer I spent grooming for, for Charlie at Hollywood Park. So um, I, thought, I thought that was key advice he gave me. You, you, you need to get out there. And, see how other people do things and learn a different perspective. What did you learn from Charlie at that time? Because at that time it was murderers row. I mean it was it was intimidating walking in there the first day and I mean he he had Ferdinand and Judge Angelucci and all these, you know, horses that you know I'd read about the blood horse and uh, so I didn't really have a position per se. I, I remember meeting him the afternoon before and uh, I said what what time should I be here tomorrow? His answer was early, and so I said, "Okay." I'll, I got there at 4:15, and he was already there. So uh, you know, just he, he was a terrific guy. I ended up grooming for the summer, and you know, every morning he'd make his rounds, and 
I'd always try to ask him a question. He was he was always, you know, would take time to answer me, and uh, he uh, it was a it was a great routine, great system, and uh, fun to be a part of, fun to watch, and uh, you know, it was also fun to watch after I left there what some of the horses did. <coughs> Uh, what's the best advice that your dad gave you that you ignored? You know what, he was always, um, he, he was always telling me to always be prepared, no matter what, have, you know, to, if something, know the answers, you know, when you talk to somebody, he, yeah, that, that's the way he was, like, um, like if something was going on, you know, always, when you go to explain something to somebody, Make sure you have all the answers. So when somebody asks you anything about it, you already know that answer. Don't say, "Well, I don't know." You know, just don't. And he was very, because he—that's the way he was. He was always thinking. He was always talking to himself and uh, thinking what he was going to say. And and so, um, but it was, I, you know, he's lucky. He got to. I, I never went to work for anybody, and I, I wish I could have worked for like a Charlie or. A, Wayne, I tried. I tried to get a job. For, I remember calling Wayne Lucas. I was uh, coming out of high school, and I wanted to go to work for him as a gallery boy at Bay Meadows. So I had all this speech. I wrote it down. I was so nervous. I'll never forget. I wrote down everything I was going to ask. So I decided. I finally got my nerve to call him. He was staying at. I found out what hotel he was staying. So I called him. It must have been like one o'clock this time in the afternoon. And it dawned on me afterwards that he's taking a nap, you know, the guy. But you know what, I called Wayne, he answers the phone, I says, you know, I'm Bob Baffert, you'll know me, I'm just, you know, I'm a, I got a jockey, so I wrote a few races, but I, I want to learn, I want to come be an exercise rider for you, a gallop boy, and I'll work hard and all this. And, he's, and he was like, instead of saying, yeah, you know, it's fine, but, you know, I'm okay, you know, don't worry, you know, like, he was so, I'll never forget, I was so impressed when I hung up the phone, he said, oh, Bob, I'm so, you know what? I just filled, I needed somebody and I just filled it a week ago. This is probably a bunch of BS, but he made me feel so good. He said, you would be perfect. God, I wish, I, I wish you would have called me a couple weeks ago. You, would, you sound perfect for what I need. And you know, maybe down the road, you know, just keep checking and, and then, and then I finally, when I went out there, like a year or two later, I, I saw him out there and said, hey, I'm, I'm the guy that called you up. Uh, oh, really? You know, like, you know, whatever. He probably got a lot of calls, but, but uh, that would have, um, but I'm glad I didn't do it because I probably would have lasted a week. And, uh, and he'd be telling everybody, see, on the way. I, I started that boy, you know, but, <laughs> but to me, Wayne Lucas has always been, I've always, when the first time I saw him in Sonoy, Arizona, running court horses. He came in there with his fancy trailer, and shiny, and he was training for this. Brought on these, there were all these well-bred quarter horses in these trials. And I remember when he was saying, hey, that's Wayne Lucas. He's like, this guy came in from New Mexico and stuff. And I remember getting up to the fence, and I was like, wow, that's, that's Wayne. Like, I'm watching some, you know, some movie star coming in there. And he just had a presence about himself. And he changed the game totally, you know. but. Number one, he's a great horse. He knows horses really well, mm -hmm. and uh, but he also brought the professionalism, the 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 business part of it, you know, because he's you know well-educated guy and brought a lot of. Uh, he just changed completely and for the better. And then when he went for thoroughbreds, he did the same thing there. And uh, but uh, you know he's lucky, you know. But I wish if I could have worked for Wayne, I really could have jump started. Uh, my career and um, you know and working for Charlie. I, I I got to be stable next to Charlie and, and near the end there and I would I would just believe him for information every day. You know, just talk to him and he was just that guy was not, he never complained about anything. He was just straight tough, tough guy. But always, you know, and he loved his horses. Just how did how did you end up coming? Same thing, my dad uh, trained quarter horses the same time Wayne did, so he had a, he, we'd known him for a long time, and um, I'd spent one summer working for him, and you know, I told him that when I graduated, you know, I might be in touch to see if I had anything open, so I kind of, I uh, kept in contact with him um, for, for a while, and then uh, I think it was 
probably around the Christmas break, I, I went out to San Anita and met with him and told him I was going to graduate in May. And, and uh, he said, I'll have a position for you. Just call me when you graduate and I'll tell you where to go. And uh, it was a great break for me because um, at the time when I graduated, I called him and said, uh, why don't you go to New York and work with uh, my son Jeff. And Jeff was a huge, huge influence on, on me and you know a lot of the guys that work for Wayne. Um, terrific horseman, strict dis disciplinarian, terrific More teacher and coach. Wayne. What's that? More so than Wayne. Oh yeah, no, I mean, if, if you were on Jeff's good side, you were, you were good with the organization. And, uh, but his, his attention to detail and you know, he was, he was uh, a perfect person to learn under because if you were the foreman in that barn, you needed to know what every single horse was doing and every person was doing at all times. And he would hold you accountable for everyone, no matter what was going on. And uh, it was a great learning environment. And uh, so I was, I was just fortunate that you know, I landed in, in the right spot. <coughs> One of the things that brought you both to this sport is the love of the horse. As you become more successful, your stables have grown. How big are they now? And quite frankly, how big is too big? Where you where you no longer feel connected to the horse? From a numbers per perspective. From a numbers perspective. Yeah, I, I, you know, my comfort level is about where I am right now, around 175. And uh, you know, there's been times where I've had more, times where I've had obviously a lot less, but. Um, for, for me, that's a comfortable number that I feel like I can know what each, each and every horse is doing every day. And, uh, you know, having a more wide spread out doesn't, doesn't really appeal to me at this time. Are you still a guy that likes to go in every day and put hands on everybody? I do, yeah. I, to me, you know, knowing your horses and, and uh, you know, especially young horses and developing them, trying to figure out, you know, what they want to do, what their potential level is. And, Hopefully, developing some derby type horses and uh, two year olds. To, to me, that's the funnest part of it. Well, I don't, I've never been, I mean, my number's always been, I try to keep 50 at Santa Anita and probably 60 at Los Alamitos. Mainly young horses, but, um, but I, the thing about it, it's tougher for when you're in the East Coast because they're constantly moving and so they. You have to have numbers because the thing about the numbers, you just, you, you don't know where that one's going to come from, you know, and so uh, you have horses that are, if they have a little problem, you know, we send them out right away or, you know, give them the time. And so, but, uh, you know, in California, we have the weather, we don't have to move, or in San Anita, we go to Del Mar, a little Salamis close by, so it's more of a, uh, like if I was back east, I'd probably need probably more because there's more space. There's, you can only expand so much in California, but uh, but there's so many, you know, he's, there's so many opportunities when you're on the East Coast. If you have a certain horse, they can you can send him to Monmouth Park, or if he's not going to fit in with here, California, we just you have, you better be pretty good because it's really tough. We're on an island out there. So uh, it's like, if you can make it there, you're going to make it. And if they don't work out, Bob, most of my clients, you know, I'll tell them, this is not a California horse, so they'll, uh, they'll ship them out to, uh, you know, another trainer, you know, to Midwest or somewhere where, you know, he can be competitive. Because, you know, you want your horse to be competitive. Let's talk about California um, in the last 12 months. What have those, what's the last 12 months been like for you? Well, it's been a little bit, uh, you know, I never thought racing, I never worried about racing, like, you know, that could be, just turn like a strawberry going bad overnight, you know, it just, man, it just changed like that. And just in a few months, and so it was like, uh, it was one of those things where not only I was worried about my business in general in California racing, but I was more worried about my employees. I have all these families, uh, what am I gonna do with them? You know, if this doesn't work out, if I'm gonna have to move back, I'm thinking, where am I gonna move to? And, and, uh, 
And so it was like, that's been going through my mind. And finally, it, I think everybody sort of felt that way. And so, but at the same time, you have to just sort of plow through it and, and worry about what you have right now and do the best that you can do. And so I think it's, it's been an eye opener for a lot of us that, uh, you know, we, you know, we better do a better job. Everybody's got to be on board. A lot, I think a lot of trainers are sort of watching everybody else. You know, that we've got to, you know, when even during the whole time this was happening, I'd be up in the grandstand in the morning and you've got the guys there that are maintenance crews are working, they're painting, they're working on the track, whatever. And if a horse, if the siren went off and the horse was, got hurt, they were even saying, that's not good for us, you know, they, everybody was worried. And so we're, we're at a uh, point where, you know, it's like, hey, this bad things can happen to the sport. And, uh, and it was like a wildfire that got out of control. We didn't know how to put it out. All we did was just point fingers at everybody, you know. And so, but now I think we've got it uh, a little bit better contained. And, uh, and, the, and the outside noise was just horrendous. The, uh, the, uh, especially with social media now, it's just, before you could, you know, guys in a bar, they could be sitting there and just tweeting out whatever they want and talking about somebody, but uh, it's the, uh, the minority noise is getting louder and, uh, and then the, um, it was, and I think management was in a sort of a tough spot. You know, you, it doesn't matter, there's no, there's nothing you can justify the horse breaks down. You can't say, well, you know, it'd be. so the story hasn't been told that this does happen in our sport and nobody wants to tell it, unfortunately. And so, uh, but our, our own fans, they understand. But I, Amy, the best thing was uh, at Breeders' Cup by having it there and those stands were full, full of people that prove that, you know what, our sport is not as bad as you. It is, you read about it. Unfortunately, um, you know, the horse, the last thing, the last race, and, it, 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 and poor, he wins. That's right, I want to ask, I mean, how many, you finally got your first class at win, but with a really terrific horse and a great train comeback job with Vito Rosso. But he was sort of overshadowed with what happened with Mongolian Groom. How do you, how do you rectify that? How do you justify that? I, I don't think you can. I mean, I think like Bob was saying, you know, I mean, it, it's it's a side of the sport that there's there's no way to defend. You know, unfortunately, it happens. We know that it could happen. I think as an industry, we're doing better and better of trying to reduce these numbers. But you know, I said afterwards, you know, I think racing a lot of times gets through a crisis and then they coast. This crisis is not over, and we can't coast. We got to keep trying to improve and improve. I mean, honestly, I didn't see that Mongolian groom had been injured until I was halfway down to the to the winter circle. So, you know, it was, it was startling to me when when I did hear it for the first time. And for me, you know, I felt bad for Vino Rosso. I felt bad for Michael Coley and his family, and Vinny Viola and his family. That you know, here here's a moment where you know they're literally winning at the pinnacle of the sport and can't fully embrace it. You know, the way that they uh, probably would have had you know, the injury not taken place, but uh, so it was, it was it was bittersweet to you know to, to win a race and at the same time you know feel feel remorseful for you know someone else's words and the industry itself and uh, so yeah it was, it was it was a little bit frustrating. You don't normally race in California, so you were. Based on the East Coast, were you immune to what was happening, or what you were hearing out of California, or was the was the assumption that it was just a California problem, or is it a problem, or is there a recognition that this is an industry-wide problem? Oh, I think without a doubt, it was. Uh, you know, those of us on the East Coast were fully aware and, and equally as concerned as anyone else. And I mean, I was watching races in California, holding my breath, hoping that you know everything would go go smoothly and. Uh, you know, so it, by no means did I feel like anyone on the East Coast was looking at it as a West Coast problem. I think everyone was looking at it as an industry problem. And as an industry, we need California to succeed. You know, 
know, it's a huge, huge part of, uh, of American racing. And uh, so, no question in my mind, everybody was looking at it as, a, as an industry wide issue. Bob, how did this affect your, how did it affect your family? How did it affect Bodhi? And I, I was, you and I have talked several times, I'll tell you, you know, from a personal standpoint, it, it got to the point where when somebody said, oh, where do you work? Uh, maybe there's a, there's a pause button. No, he's a, yeah, I mean, he's, he, he's been at school and they'll, his teacher, like, they all watch horses and they'll mention it to him and, uh, and he's sort of like, he doesn't know what, how to answer it, you know, and, and that's basically, we are all like that. We, you know, I remember when it first started happening, actually, it, uh, when they started the count, was at, I think it was at 17 or whatever, and I didn't, nobody, I didn't even know, you know, as the trainers, we don't, we're not counting. And so I didn't know it was that many, so then the count started, and, uh, and I think it was probably harder on my wife, Jill, because it's something that it's like, and she just loves the horses, you know, and so when something happens, and, and she's constantly says, please, please, Bob, don't, if you have any, you ever had that? Don't, don't, if you have a horse that you just feel, just a little, they look you the wrong way, do not send them out there. So that's extra pressure on everybody. Because sometimes you can miss something and they can look fine and it happens and you're like, oh, how did I, you know, it just it beats us up. So I think everybody, the whole backside of it, but like morale and still, it's just everybody's like, you know, every time that horn would go off. And I keep telling them to change the horn, make, make bells or something, but on that horn, everybody was, the anxiety was just, and it's still there, the anxiety. And so it takes the fun, you know, if, out of the racing, you know, you're supposed to, you know, race is supposed to be fun, the owners come out, you go over there, like he won the Breeders' Cup, but Vino <laughs> just ran unbelievable race, and, and I go down there, and, you know, I ran second, but, you know, uh, I just, you know, I got outrun, so I go down there, and they're, the first question they ask me, so what do you think of Mongolian Groom? I go, I don't know, did he run third? I mean, I didn't know, and they told me that he got hurt. I go, oh, really? And I was like, and so um, it, it, it just, it's, you know, to San Diego, everybody works so hard, you know, and they have the bets, they have everything, and, and it's the last race. Let's talk about the reforms that have been put in place. Um, you know, one of the things that's put in place is you have to apply to work to try to apply to, you have to apply to work. How is that impacted? Well, I think the reforms, I think we, a lot of, there was a lot of knee-jerk reaction. I think a lot of it was like overboard, you know, and uh, I, I think that, I think the main thing is I, it was a wake up for the trainers, hey, you better go over that horse. And, you know, our veterinarians we have, you know, we go over, you know, through if I have a horse and you know, I'll get there in the morning, I'm going to breeze a horse or something, and the, and the guy will say, you know what, one of my... I get to report every morning. So and so has this, so and so has that. We, we're not, we better not work him. He doesn't, you know. And that's it. We have our own reforms. And that was just to make sure all everybody was on the same page. But at the, at the end of the day, I think the surface was probably the main thing. It was deep. Uh, I've never seen the track so deep when we came back last year. And they just kept adding more sand more sand, and every time a horse got hurt, they just add more sand. That was the, we got to slow it down, you know, and so, and that's why I say racing, we need more science in the dirt. We, we don't have that, we've had, we've got guys that are great track guys, track men, but they really, they just, it's like sometimes they, when they mix their, it's like soup, they add a little this, add a little that, there's no really science to it. And so, you know, we need to, to when, and so the deeper it got, you know, when the horse gets fatigued, that's when they start getting hurt. They might, they might hurt the back and the front, and they get off the back, the front. So a lot of it is the, it was getting deep, tiring, and the horses, I remember having Johnny B when he came out to, to ride. Uh, he said, well, how's the track feel? I said, man, it's, it's, deep. it's deep. They go in and they have to work out. They're not going over the top of it to make it, uh, uh, so, 
And you know, and, and if you talk to somebody and you talk to the track guys and say, you know what, I think it's too. But what's happened is that in the sport, in a lot of sports, you become so successful at something. So if I say something, they say, well, Baffert doesn't like it. He likes it fast. So we're not going to do it for him. I, I, I want it for every. I want everybody to have to say. And the thing is that these horses, when they get fatigued, that's when they get hurt. And uh, they're working on it now, but it's still, I think, it was a depth of track. It was deep. If you could, you know, on the Friday, the breeder fell. It was really ridiculously deep. And, it, and that's, not, that's not good for horse racing, because these horses, they struggle. They, they weren't finishing. Like Los Alamitos, um, it's, it's, it's a faster. They run fast, but they can come from off. They can come from last. They can come. They, go, they get over it, and they come back or not really that tired, but they, and you know, good horses run there, and so, you know, they have to, we have to find that, that, that little, and I'm not a track guy, and that's the first thing I told you, I'm not a track guy, and they say, thank you, Bob, and I go, but I can tell you, and he can tell you, that my horses are not traveling well over this track, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're having trouble with it, we got these best horses in the world, or they can't even break a minute in the morning. And they're struggling. They come back like it's the first work they've ever had. And that's and so it's like you training. If you got athletes and you said we're going to go to the beach, but you're not going to train near the water. You're going to train in the heavy stuff and run on that. Eventually, it wears the body out. And I and I think that's what a lot of it. And then we had all those rains, and when it dries out, that's what to me that's when it, I felt. So I would, I didn't have any issues last year. I, I knock on wood. But the uh, but I would, we learned to, well, I'm going to wait a couple more days. I'm going to let it dry out really well. And, and as a trainer, that's what we're supposed to do. You know, you both go out there and, and a lot of guys, you know, they just feel like, you know, they've got to, and so, but unfortunately, I, I think now, I think everybody's on the, sort of the same page now. And, uh, Todd, you've been another issue with Lasix. You've been fairly outspoken. Um, about your thoughts about LASIKs. What are they, for the record? And how do you think that that plays into moving forward? Well, I just think from a public perception standpoint, we have to get to a no race day medication policy. And um, you know, LASIKs is the kind of the final <laughs> issue that uh, you know everyone's very divisive on. And you know, I can see the pros and cons. Uh, from the horse's perspective, from the owner's perspective, from the trainer's perspective, but I think from the standpoint of the right look for racing is no race day medication is the way we need to go. And it's it'll be complicated for for you know a while, I think, until everyone kind of figures out what a what a program, you know, new program can be put in place. And you know, I think there's some solid research out there suggesting maybe that 24 hour Lasix is potentially beneficial. I mean, there's no question. I mean, we scope every horse after every breeze and every horse after every race, and a lot of horses bleed, and a lot of them bleed after they leave the, you know, leave the winter circle. So it's, I think, deciding which ones are truly affected by it, um, you know, is also another issue. But I, I just think that, you know, when things happen, like what has happened over the last year, if we don't have that defense of we don't medicate our horses, you know, for races, I think we're putting ourselves in a really compromising position. But is this a guns or abortion issue where you're never going to get everybody under the same tent? No question. I don't think you're going to satisfy anything. I mean, everyone, no matter what you do, especially in the, in the horse industry. I mean, you know, anytime I've ever been asked to sit in on a trainer's panel or I mean, you can get 10 guys in the room and have a lot of different opinions. It's just uh, so, but I mean, I think we have to look at it. What's best for horse racing? And I think no race day medication is where we need to be. What do you think, Tom? I'm so tired of hearing about it. I'm like, get rid of it. You know, it's like, it's, it's one of those things where I, I really think if you have a really, truly leader, he's, he's going to bleed. I mean, I'm, I've had horses that once they bleed out their nostrils, we better turn them out. But the, the thing is, um, I always worry about 
And he probably worries about, I said, I just hope I have somebody to run against. Because I worry about the littler outfits and stuff. And so that's why, I, that's the only thing I had against it. Well, you know, to me, I, I wish they would have just gotten rid of it, the turf racing first. Because then, then they're, like in Europe, they don't use it on turf. Because I think turf racing probably, you don't probably need it as well. Because you're not getting any kickback. Where dirt, they're running fast, they're getting kickback, it's getting in their, in their face, in their nose, but uh, I, I've gotten to the point where, you know, if it's, if it's gone. I grew up in Arizona, running horses here. Before I went to, we didn't, we, we didn't have beauty or license. So it was like, I learned without men, so it's, like, it's not like, you know, sometimes it can be a crutch. You know, I remember when, when San Diego, when we were sitting in all those meetings, you're in there, and we're trying to figure out. I said, "Well, let's get rid of mute. Let's go 48 hours with a mute, and uh, let's let's drop Lasix to five five cc's." And man, I got some trainers that were mad at me. You and, know? You, and you told me at the time that you usually give three and a half cc's. I give I give like three. I don't give that much Lasix. I did the Prevent, and and I had guys calling me and says, and I didn't even know they gave 10 cc's. The guys were giving 10 cc's. I go. You know, you know, it's so, uh, it's one of those things. I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not a trainer, obviously, but your phrase when, when you and I had, and we're not going to talk about who with these discussions, but you're, you said at 10 cc's, you're liable to only have lactic acid in here. Yeah, I mean, I didn't really have, I mean, I've, I've never given a horse 10 cc's, you know, so, but uh, I, I think in racing, we're, as trainers, and I, I, I've been in the same boat, you hear, well, so and so's doing this, they're doing that, so then you start doing that, well, he's doing this, you know, you know, and that's the way, that's the way it works, and so, uh, but uh, I, I really think that once we get, you know, at 48 hours, the view, does it make a difference? At least it, you know, they do in New York, it works there, I mean, I've never had a problem there, and, uh, and so, um, but to me, the and racing, I'd like to see go away, is clenbuterol. I think that's a problem. I think when that came around, uh, that was the that was the, the start of the super trainer. I know at Los Alamitos, the quarter horse guy, finally, Dr. Allred, mm -hmm. he finally just got rid of it. I mean, they test their hair. And if they have, within six months, those guys are gone. And I think clenbuterol, and uh, you know when it came out, well, it's a good drug if they get sick. But you know what? That should be really, that should be out. You know, I think to me, um, that that that's where guys they know how to they know how to work the system there and like computer, computer, all that stuff. And it's always you see, you see it coming up over and over. But uh, I really think that should be out. Uh, well, another medication you guys you know spend a tremendous amount of money with clients each year by yearly the bisphosphonate issue. How concerned are you about that medication and horses that you're, you're buying? Not that, not that you give it, but that they have been given. Well, I think it's extremely concerning because first of all, you're in a lot of cases getting a horse that you didn't know that this was administered to. From, from my understanding, this is a medication that's beneficial to horses that are at least four years old. and also, from what I understand, it can alter the way that rating graphs look in a pre-purchase situation. So, to me, something like that is potentially very harmful because, you know, Bob might be getting a two-year-old in that he doesn't know has been administered to this, might not be showing some of the warning signs that need to be backed off, potentially have a horse get injured like that. So, you know, one of the points that I tried to make a couple of weeks ago after the Breeders' Cup was, you know, everyone's for transparency, and, and Bob and I and the other trainers are the end users, and ultimately we are responsible when the horses go out there and get injured. But, you know, the transparency needs to start way before that, you know, when the horses are bred, when they're born, when they're full, when they're raised, when they're weaned, when they're yearlings, you know, when they're two-year-old training cells. So, you know, we're the guys taking the inherent risk at the end of the day because we're the ones putting them on the track, but if a lot of things have been done to some of these horses that we're not aware of, we might not be in a position where we can make the right decisions. So 
I'm all for transparency, but it needs to start at the beginning. Are you more likely a buyer if a consigner has said this horse has never been given bisphosphonates? I, I, I would certainly be more confident in, in buying one, you know, and, and uh, at the same time, you know, I, I think that was a wake-up call for the industry. A lot of guys that, you know, I, I don't think they were giving bisphosphonates thinking, you know, this is potentially going to be a long-term problem. I just don't think they had enough information. And sometimes it was something, oh, this works, start using it, but they don't really have enough information. They haven't seen enough horses administered it to know what potentially some of the, the harmful effects could be. I didn't even know it was until a few months ago when I started, when it came out. I, I, uh, I read about it and I, and I asked my vet, I said, yeah, but we don't use it. It's like for older horses, for like, like the jumping people uh, in the show horse industry uh, use it. But, but then you got to think and I said, well, wait a minute, what if they were, they were probably, you know, some of these guys and two year olds in training were probably given it or whatever, and you, you know, it's, and then you read about it, like it's sort of, it sounds like very sinister, you know, you, but I'm like him, they probably didn't realize how much damage it really is. They probably thought, hey, if you give it, it'll help fill in the, because uh, the sesamoid, that's the, that's the it, I was reading about it, just, it sort of it fills up the, like it's bone, but it's really not bone, so, and you read that, and uh, like, wow, this is pretty, this is not, this is not cool, but, you know, it's, it's tough, but there's so much money now involved in, this, in the selling. All the money's in the, in the, in the, in the, in the sale right now. It, is, model, is, is racing's model broken? Do we now race to breed as opposed to breed to race? Well, a lot of people, they, they, they raise these horses, they just got to get them, once they get them to the, they, they, they want to get their, they, they, they bake their, their pie, they, they sell it, and they don't want to eat any of the pie afterwards, you know. So it's one of those things where, so we so we get them, and then all of a sudden something happens, and uh, we're responsible. I mean, and we're like, how did that happen? Well, it could have happened. This horse might have, you know, had something, and finally it gave. Uh, I've seen horses out there, and, and a lot of these horses uh, that I've had that 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 got hurt. They've never been injected in the joint. You know, they're talking about this and you know, or the shock wave. And there's another thing: the shock wave gets a bad rap. First of all, the shock wave—that's a bad name for that machine. It should have never been named that. It should have been named something. Fred, you know, what would you no, it should have been like uh, uh, the uh, stimulator, bone stimulator, whatever. It, it's good for if you want to heal, like if you have like uh, uh, shins or high suspensories, like. It's not for, you don't want to use it and run a horse three days later, whatever it is. But, you know, if we use it, we, we use it as a, to help heal the horse. Is, it a, is it a 30 day stand down in your mind? Yeah, 30 days or whatever, you know, it's, but it's, it's within, I think it's within three days or four days, it's, it doesn't have any effect. I mean, I, in California it's 10 days or whatever. So it's not like, but the sound of it sounds horrible, you know, shockwave, you know. And it gets a bad rap, but it's actually, uh, I use it like if you have horses with a, like especially on a deep track, you get little high suspensories that are minor, but it's, you know, before we used to paint them and blister them, and, and that was, you don't have to do that with a, with a shockwave. You shockwave them, it brings, stimulates the area, and that's, that's all what it does, but uh, it does have, I guess, a numbing effect, but I've, uh, it's supposed to last. Like, I don't know, 72 hours, whatever it is like that, but, um, it, you know, there's, there's things out like that that people just throw out there, well, you know, you see a horse, well, he, he got hurt, but eight months ago they shocked him. he must have had an issue. Well, that's, it's, like Joe Biden says, a lot of malarkey, you know, it's got a, he might, might have had a shit or something, it's like anything, but uh, we just have to define those things a lot better. Because what happened to San Diego when things went bad, everything was pointing to the drugs, the this, whatever. But at the end of the day, it's the surface is the was the main. It's like a little leak in the boat, and we have to stop that leak. But you know, and but uh, we need we need to concentrate, you know, on better racing surface, dirt surface. And right away they go well. 
we better go to synthetic. And the synthetic comes up again. Well, synthetic, you know, it's nice to train on and everything. Probably should be on training tracks, you know, uh, especially during the winter season, where when it rains, you know, it's an even uh, 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 surface. But um, right now, you know, we're just we just want something to to work, and uh, we got our work cut out for us. We do. Different topic, better topic. And sometimes you guys become a victim of your own success. If you win four races in a day, Todd, are you when you go home, are you thinking about the one that you didn't win? Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm guilty of uh, you know of, of that. Uh, always trying to figure out you know, the ones that didn't go didn't go the way we had hoped. Um, so, but I, I mean, I, I think that's probably the case with anyone who's trying to be successful in whatever endeavor they they're 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 doing. You know, I mean, if you're if you're not always striving to do better, then you know you're you're probably not uh, gonna gonna meet your expectations. Hopefully, at the, at the end of the day. So, um, I think I think that's the one thing I try to check myself every once in a while is like sit back and try to try to appreciate, you know, the, the good times, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's the way I'm wired. I'm always thinking about the one that, that I messed up. What is the one training job you would like to have had back? Not that you're blending the, 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 the buyer or, or the way the race set up. What's the one course or the one race you would have liked to have said, you know, I did this a little bit differently? I uh, don't you know, this thing ends at 9.30. <laughs> um, Don't worry, because he's got to go again. He's got to go too. So. Yeah, uh, I, I, you know, I, I can't tell you one specific one that I thought I, you know, I, I really necessarily screwed up. I, I, I think one thing that that uh, you know that I can improve on is sometimes I get I get locked in on a race and, and uh, you know try to make sure that I have the horse ready to go and and. Uh, horrible about scratching. You know, when I get a horse in, sometimes I look at a race and say, man, I know this isn't the right spot, but there's only one way to prove it, and that's to go over there and, uh, and, uh, and not win. But, uh, so, you know, I, I can't think of one specific course or, or race that, that uh, you know, I wish I had a do-over, but, um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> What's your do-over? Um, American Girl and Travers. I beat myself up with that. I, I didn't do a very good. I wasn't planning on running there, and then I, the last minute we ran, and when I got, I've never been so overwhelmed the day before when I went to train that horse. It was like I really, I said, man, it's, it was like I didn't realize how big it was when the place was filled. Twenty thousand people showed up. And yeah. it was like I was like, man, I hope I don't mess this thing up. And going in, I was a little bit like, you know what, I didn't really, I just, that's the one, I, we lost focus. You know, you, you, you get on this run and you get this great horse and pretty soon you get to the point where it doesn't matter what I think, he's just so good, he's going to win. And it was, um, I just wish I could redo that because I felt like I let the whole town down and then when he, when he got beat that day. Would you horse. train him different or would you have not run him different? Well, it trained her differently, and um, it's, I just, I, I came back and I wasn't going to do anything with him, and, um, and I, or else I could have just taken him up there, but, uh, but I would have done, I would have trained him a little bit differently, and then all of a sudden I wasn't going to go, and so I sort of rushed him a little bit to, to go, and when he got there, and the day before he trained, we, we usually trained him early in the morning so he wouldn't get worked up. We, we trained during a, a special break, and all the people were out there, and I made a mistake, and I sent him with a pony. And I told the rider, whatever you do, just don't go too fast. And I sent him with Jimmy with a pony, and when I took him, he thought every time we had a pony with him, that's when he would freeze, because he thought he was going to work. And he went really fast around there. He just, he was just, I was so mad at the rider. I kept it, and he jerked, and the rider, they're like, Prima donnas, he jerked his stirrups up, he had the camera on his head. It was just too much showboating. And when I got back, he, I mean, he looked unbelievable. If the race would have been that day, he would have won. But he took too much out. He came back, and he was really blowing. 
And he was actually corded up. I mean, I mean, he was blowing hard. He was drinking a lot of water, and it was like I didn't feel good about that. And when I went to saddle him the next day, I could tell he was like. And I told Victor, I said, you know, Victor, you're going to have to help me out of here, man. This guy's he's not he's not like I can tell. You know, as a trainer, you can tell when you're putting the saddle on him that they're man. This guy he's on. You know, he's on. And sometimes you're putting the saddle on them, they're like, they got this little look in their eye like they're, uh, I go, oh, man, this is not, you read that video, I'm like, oh, this is not good. Because my wife always, what, what do you think, how do you look? I don't know, he's a little quiet, you know. But sometimes they run well. But um, I was really leaking badly that, that day, you know, I was afraid. But he still, he ran one of the toughest, he was completely empty at the top of the stretch. Empty to me. And he still almost pulled it off. And those are the great ones do that. And um, uh, he just, you know, he gutted it out. But I was so uh, disappointed. I sort of felt bad for the Keen Ice Group because they'd won. And we were sitting down. They wanted to talk to me first. And we're explaining to it. And we all felt horrible. Um, and when I, and all of a sudden, I see uh, Keen Ice owner. Uh, Jerry, and he's standing there. I said, you know, Jerry, I think I'm sitting in your seat. You need to be sitting here because you won the, you, act, you, you guys won the race. You sit here. So I get up and I walk away. Everybody gets up and falls me. <laughs> it was like, it was like they couldn't really enjoy it because it was all about, um, it's just like, um, you know, Todd wins the British Cup Classic and then that tragedy happens and it just, you know, it takes away and, and the horse, by the way, we did a tremendous job with it. When I, when I saw Bino show up the first day at San Diego, I said, oh, shit. <laughs> Man, he looks good. And so uh, it was one of those things where, um, you know, he, he sort of, because I, I like to look at all the horses. And we knew, it's, you know, and I told him, it it's Bino and him. It's a, I figured it was going to come down to those two. But, um, but it, all in all, it was still, you know, as a trainer, I feel we. I feel good when if my horse shows up, it runs or gets beat. As long as they show up, we just want them to turn for home, and they're there. They're trying to run. That's all you can ask for as a trainer. And sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. You once told me that your job as a trainer is to, at the quarter pole of the Kentucky Derby, I'm sure it's exactly the same for you, give everybody a chance to believe that they can win. I mean, yes, you want to see them running when they quit running. That's why everybody asks, why do you watch the race in the paddock? Because it's close to the exit. It's close right to the exit. I go to my car and I'll just talk to the jockey later on and just get out there and go. And so, um, and everybody thinks I'm kidding, but I don't. I just, we leave immediately. I just, I just cut out that door and I'm out of there. But, um, but it's, it's something that the um, racing is just, we're, I'm so fortunate that I, found something that I love to do, and I was able to do it. It's, um, I've met a lot of good people, I've had a lot of, you know, you know, every once in a while. I love YouTube, I can go back there when I'm feeling down and watch all these old races, and, uh, but Todd, Todd has been unbelievable. I mean, he came up, and um, his, his earning record is like, it's untouchable, I mean. What is your favorite memory, Todd? What is your best day? My, my funnest, most fun win for me was Rex Riches winning the Belmont, and I think part of it, you know, was part of it was the fact that it was she was a Philly winning the Belmont for the first time for a Philly in over a hundred years. Part of it was it's my first classic win, and it's the most you know, animated I've ever seen you. I mean, for literally for three or four weeks, we were undecided about what we were going to do, whether or not we were going to run her. And, you know, after the Preakness, we started to look at it, and she was she was training, you know, fantastic. And as soon as the gates opened and she went to her nose, I said, "Dang, you, you know, why did you run here?" You know, and, and and she kind of crept back into position and said, "Well, maybe you know, we still have a shot." And then, you know, at the top of the stretch, she got to curdle, and I, I don't think you can have one race where as many emotions go through your mind as during that race from the beginning, you know, the stretch long duel, um, 
where it looked like she was going to win, it looked like Kerlin was going to come back, and it was just, you know, it's uh, kind of so many different things going through your mind in, in less than two and a half minutes. That, uh, but uh, even to today, I haven't had so many people tell me how much fun they had watching the race, you know, when you go to the airports or whatever, and people would come up to you and say, oh, I was standing on my couch waiting for the Philly. And, and uh, so, yeah, that's... Uh, that's still the most fun. And for a guy who generally does things by the book, to run a Philly in a mile and a half race, that was a definite step outside of the comfort zone. That was a different different move. What led you, or, or how did she lead you to putting her in the starting game? Well, first of all, she was just exceptionally good. You know, I mean, she uh, she was uh, enormously talented, but she was she was really bred for the Belmont. You know, she was by AP and D, and she was a half-sister to a horse that had won the Belmont. And you, you know, if you look at her pedigree, there's just Belmont winners all through it. And, uh, and at the end of the day, I, th I think to win to win the Belmont, you need a horse that wants to stay the trip, one that will turn off early. And you can't have one that's going to kind of be headstrong and cool in you know, the first part of the race. And she was a tremendous galloper. Um, so she, she fit all the criteria, it was just a matter of, you know, is, is the Philly capable of, you know, at a mile and a half competing against what, and that was a, that was an exceptionally strong crop of three-year-olds, you know, Street Sense was, was a pretty target. ballsy move. Mm -hmm. And I think when Street Sense decided not to go, he said, you know, we're willing to take on Hard Spun and Curlin, are we willing to take on Street Sense also, and so when he decided not to go, we felt like maybe that was the, the little bit of the opening that we were looking for. It's a little bit of weight training for the Phillies against the Colts. Exactly. I, mean, uh, I got a question for you. How have you stayed married to Johnny B so long? I go through jockeys like this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's quite a team. Yeah, thing. John, Johnny's a terrific person to begin with. He's ultra, con ultra consistent. Um, you know, I, th I think, you know, for what we do, it's, it's, it's demanding. You show up every day and, you know, the ups and downs of the game, but sometimes you forget from a jockey's perspective, you know, they're involved in the, in the, in the same thing. And to, to ride at a high level, basically, the whole year now, I mean, you know, these guys will take a short vacation here and there, but, you know, to, to compete at a high level and be on all the time, I mean, he's the most consistent guy I've, I've, I've seen and, uh, you know, he's uh, completely reliable and uh, you know shows up, gives you 110 percent every time. And I think you yeah. know, we're all all going to make some errors, but uh, usually he's his are minimal and his intentions are right. You talked about being married to people for a long time. Do you think that you guys have been married to Jimmy for a long time? You've been married. You've got assistance for a long time. What is the key to keeping the business? I mean, I, I think from a from a assistant standpoint, they enjoy working around good horses, and uh, you know, I think that's what that what drives us all is that that you know hope of finding that next good horse and you know competing in, in some of these big races, and uh, you know, so I, I think we've been fortunate. You know, a lot of the guys that work work with us, guys and girls, um, you know, been with us a long time. And I think they they appreciate. You know, a good work environment, a consistent uh, routine, and working, you know, with quality people and quality horses. What goals do you have left? Um, I, I don't really point towards, I think this is a difficult uh, business to, to be in and say, you know, I want to win this number of Kentucky Derbies, or I want to win this much purse money, or this many races. Um, you know, but, when, but when you start the year? There's a day or two or three or something that's always circling on the calendar. What is it for you? Well, I, I think we all start the year kind of looking at, you know, do we have a derby horse? Is there potentially a you know, horse that uh, can, can get you there? And what's so great about, not, you know, the, the derby itself is there's so many great opportunities that come up to it. Literally, you know, every weekend starting in February, there'll be a race at Oakland or the fairgrounds or Gulfstream or where have you that are, you know, 
significant, significant races, uh, stallion making races in their own right. So it's always a fun time of the year. But uh, I think I think Derby season's probably one of the, the most fun. Do you have something under the radar you're looking forward to? Hopefully, they're definitely under the radar. <laughs> <laughs> I've never really had any goals. Uh, my goals, I just, I'm a, every yeah, your year. Your goal was to make sure mom didn't find out about writing. <laughs> but I've, I've always just been, um, I'm always, I'm just, I'm just waiting if I'm going to, who's going to be the next big horse in the barn, like these two year olds, I think, watching these two year olds. I've always loved the young horses develop, and you're hoping, who, who's going to be, a, will I have another good one? I remember when American Pharaoh uh, retired. It was so, I went through like a two months depression because you go through this whirlwind of triple crown and all this attention and all of a sudden it's just gone. And you're like really just like, what, what else, you know, what, what can be better? And it took a little while and all of a sudden here comes Airgate. He hits the, the scene. So we're always looking for that who is going to come and take that next spot and like you know and you're watching these horses develop so to me we're always looking you know like is this the one or else i'll think one's the one and then jill would say i think you're a little bit too high on that mm -hmm. horse and she'll pull me up but uh, it, it's like we're um we're like uh i'm not at gary stevens mode yet where the last, every horse the last one he rode is the best That's he's ever rode we're, we get like, I'm getting to that age now where I feel that way, but uh, I, I really feel that, um, and, and Todd's the same way. We just want, just, are we gonna, is there a superstar? We're waiting on a superstar uh, to uh, emerge from out of the pack, and, uh, and that's what we live for. I mean, it's just like, and I never, I don't take any vacations, but I just feel like I'm on vacation all the time. When I run a horse out of town, <coughs> Uh, when we ran Justified with Triple Crown or Pharaoh, that was our vacation. You know, you bring the family and, and you enjoy it. And it, it's like uh, those are memories that I'll always cherish. You know, when we get to the Belmont Triple Crown, you know, the whole family comes in and, and, and watches. And, and when it works out, it, it's great. And we're all, you know, we, it, you know, horses bring people together, especially good horses. They bring everybody together, the family. Uh, everybody, the owners, you get close to the to the to the owners of the horses, and they get close. And um, and when you have a good derby horse, uh, you you have a lot of you have a lot of friends. I get start getting called and say, "Mom." And one thing though, my family has gotten very good. I don't know if you're the, at reading the form because if I have a derby horse that looks a little bit shaky. They call me up, my siblings, they call me up and say, you know, Bob, we can't make it this year. You know? <laughs> <laughs> We've got a lot going on. You're on your own. And, um, and so uh, I remember we wore him. I bought, you know, we bought wore him and mud down. And I said, you know, I think I got that. So nobody showed up. You know, we're going to go. So, uh, but it's really fun, especially when my parents were around. It was so much fun. I, and that's the only, the sad part is they, they weren't there to enjoy the, the Triple Crown, you know, I wish they were there, and it was, uh, it was very emotional for me, but uh, it, it, these horses, they bring so much joy, you know, and, uh, and that's what, uh, and that's why when things don't go right, and if they get hurt, it's just, it, it's, we, you know, it really affects us, you know, people don't, you know, uh, uh, they don't realize the, the hurt, you know, when you, there's nothing worse than going to the barn the next day and that stall is empty. It's just terrible. And so, uh, but, uh, but I think right now, I think racing, I can see, I think the Breeders' Cup was great momentum to get things back because people, the place was filled. The play, people showed up. Nobody showed up if it would have been empty or like, oh, they don't want to go anymore. Um, uh, that would have really hurt, but the, you know, to me, it, it, it felt like you know, Santa Anita did a great job. You know, we uh, we, we we all pulled together, and uh, we all threw in. We 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 put our egos on the side, let these veterinarians. You know, we don't trust you, but we're going to double check your horse. Hey, go ahead, 
check them out. And uh, so, you know, we welcome them. You know? And so, and, and I think there's a big change there now. And so, um, we just got to march forward and keep it going. Todd, how, Bob mentioned family. How hard is this on your family? From uh, just, just from being a trainer. Well, it's you know it's such a it's such a time consuming and uh, you know I've always said it's more of a, a way of a lot way of life than an occupation. But uh, you know it, it, it's also I think in, the cool thing about it is that your family can really participate. Now that my kids are older and they're out you know working at Saratoga during the summers and you know. And, can, can share the big moments, come to the big races, and uh, be a part of that. So, you know, there's a lot of sacrifice, but there's also a lot of reward at the other side that, you know, would be unique to this to this business as opposed to, you know, maybe a corporate executive who's, you know, going in and, and working nine to five, and, you know, maybe, maybe their family's not really knowing what really goes into it and being able to participate and, and go to races and stuff. So, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, it has its checks and balances. Do they have a desire to follow you in the business? Well, actually, you know, one of the sort of disturbing things to me about the last nine or ten months or years, you know, my, my oldest son Peyton's at Texas A&M right now, and he's um, in the equine program there, and, and for the most part, he's, he's kind of wanted to, to train horses for, for a long time, and I think, uh, you know, the last year has sort of been you know, where's the industry going, what kind of opportunities are going to be there, and uh, so I think it was, you know, something that he and I talked about a lot, and, and I've honestly never encouraged him to train more, so I've never told him that I thought it was a bad idea, and if he decides that that's what he wants to do, I really endorse it, but um, I, th I think it's kind of given him cause for concern to see where the industry's going, and uh, you know, maybe he's considering vet school now a little more than he was, but, uh, so, yeah. Small animal. <laughs> <laughs> Nine to five, small animal, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that was, that was sort of a, you know, an internal um, thing for my family that, that, you know, that was directly impacted by kind of the... When he asks for advice, what do you, what, what, how, what do you tell him? Well, I, I, I tell him, you know, the one thing that I tell him, and, and, Bob spoke about this earlier. So you, whatever you do, do something that you're passionate about, something that you love, and something you enjoy, and then you know the rest will fall into place. So you know, if, if training is what you decide you want to do, then go at it full speed ahead. But you know, it's you also have time to make a decision. I think as a young person, and I, I know I was guilty of this. When, you know, you, you leave college, you want everything to happen right away. And, that's a good thing to, to want that, but sometimes you know you look back now and say, man, it wasn't it wasn't quite as timely as I thought it was back then. Uh, what about you? Is Bodie your force for training? Bodie, uh, I would I, I would never encourage training, I, only because um, <coughs> there's too many disappointments in the game, a lot of disappointment, and you have to have the right you have to be the right <coughs> mental. And he's really, he's a, he's a, I don't think he would have that, like Joe, who sort of has a lot of his mother in him, where he's just, it would bother him, you know, when he hears things, it bothers him. And uh, I think to be a trainer. By the way, it bothers you too. Yeah, so you have to have a certain uh, mental, uh, the, the way you are, very, um, sort of a, more of a laid back, you know, so you gotta handle a lot of, you're going to be handling a lot of bad news, and it's a lot of disappointments because of all the, the losses. But you know, every day, I mean, we might think, "Oh, he's doing great," but we don't have a good day. But there's always something, somebody sick or something going on, and um, we really don't want to encourage that. And plus, he's never really been—he wants to be a weather man. You know, he's always been—he he likes weather, and um, he can tell you everything about weather. <laughs> And he watches TV shows about weather, and that's all he's going to do. He's a weather guy. So he's, so he's never shown me that he's a horse guy ever. He's never wanted to hold a horse. He's never wanted to do anything. But you know, he likes the horses. But he likes the, 
but he he's very uh, he likes the big races. He like you know he's always asking me, Dad, what do you like? What do you, you know he's getting to that age and he, uh, you know he gets interested. You know he was uh, so it's fun that he's at the age now where he's really getting into it and uh, and he's very spoiled. You know like every you know we want him to uh, to uh, he's seen all these big horses. American Pharaoh justified been through that role, like, but you know, I, it, it's really these good horses. That I got to enjoy them with my older kids too, because they were, they, they were during. I was working so hard in the quarter horse business at night, and they were really hard, you know, been around there for them because this game, it just, it just, it just takes all your time. You have to, if you want to stay at that level, you know, I would love to take a week off and go to Europe or something, but. You just can't because you're just you're always worried about, you know, I've always been like a sort of a control free kind of guy. And so, um, but yet I have a great staff, I have Jimmy and everything, but still at the end of the day, you know, you just want to be right on top of it. Charlie Whittingham used to say, I'll take a vacation when I'm dead. Um, last question to both of you. Uh, we've talked about this before, but what is it that you love about horses? Well, you've asked me that before. I was, what really got me when I was little, I would smell their noses, their, their, their nuzzle in there, and uh, I love that smell. You know, that's what really got me. There, there's, there's a certain smell. I mean, it's sort of corny, but I just love that smell, and, uh, and I just fell in love with them and at, a, at a young age, and I've always told everybody that once racing gets in your blood, there's no rehab to get out, you have to die. And so, um, and that's why people think, how can you just work seven days a week and just be so, uh, and, and it's just, they're, they're noble, they're, they're great companions, they're, you know, I used to love riding them, you know, I, I grew up on a ranch, so I'd, I'd get home after school, sat on my horse, and just ride for hours and hours. And it was, to me, it was like going snow skiing, because you have to concentrate on your, on your horse, you're not thinking about anything else, and, uh, just to think how it was in, like in the old west, you know. Imagine traveling on a horseback. But uh, I've always considered myself just, a, you know, a horse lover, western type. I got involved with quarter horses, and I really didn't like thoroughbreds when I was growing up. You know, I, just, I watched them on television and all that, but I never dreamt that I would be a, a thoroughbred trainer. Being, you know, it was just something that wasn't even on my radar. You know, so to be in this position, I still every once in a while I just have to pinch myself like, man, I've done really all this, and um, we're just, you know, and, and here we are, the, and I got to go to the most beautiful school in the United States, the U of A. What is it about horses that you love? Well, there, there's a lot of things I love about horses. I mean, everything good in my life, and, you know, since a childhood has been because of horses, but uh, the, th the thing that I love more than anything is the constant challenge of trying to figure out horses. And uh, you know, I love going to the sales, I love judging confirmation, and, and uh, I feel like it's, it's, it's the ultimate puzzle challenge because no matter how many good horses you see, no matter how many you're around, no matter how many sales you go to, there's a constant learning curve, and uh, you know, you're trying to improve that. And that's that's one of the things that I really enjoy. Thank you all very much.